Crem 2 News begins now. Thank you for joining us on Crem 2 Plus. I'm Tim Pham. This is your Crem 2 News Week in Review. Join us as we take a closer look at some of the biggest stories in the Inland Northwest this past week. I'm at the Kootenai County Jail where Alexander Mercurio waits to go before a federal judge. The U.S. Attorney's Office says he was arrested the day before he allegedly had plans to attack Coeur d'Alene churches on behalf of ISIS, starting with churches closest to his home. A swift arrest over the weekend in Coeur d'Alene prevented what the FBI says could have been a terror attack on behalf of ISIS. The FBI says Alexander Mercurio allegedly pledged his allegiance to ISIS and spent roughly two years planning to attack Coeur d'Alene churches. Today, we confirmed Mercurio is a student currently enrolled at North Idaho College. Coeur d'Alene Public Schools confirms he attended Lake City High School and graduated last year. During his junior and senior year, the district says he enrolled in the Idaho Digital Learning Alliance, taking classes entirely online. Court documents say Mercurio used a school-issued laptop to message who he thought was ISIS. In a statement, the district says it issued Mercurio a Chromebook to access his online classes. It adds all electronic devices issued to students have controls in place to manage their internet access. These controls include internet filters that block inappropriate content as required by state and federal law. The district says late last school year, the FBI asked for information related to Mercurio's online activity. The district says it cooperated as the FBI conducted its investigation. And the potential for a coordinated attack here in the homeland is now increasingly concerning. Through that investigation, the FBI discovered messages they say Mercurio sent in late March. They include his alleged plans to attack the nearest church and kill as many people as possible. Court documents say his plan involved using a flame sword, explosives, knives, a machete, a pipe, and firearms. I checked in with some churches in the area. One pastor told me this incident is resurfacing discussions about safety while also maintaining a welcoming environment. Mercurio is expected to make his first appearance in federal court tomorrow morning. Now, we did request an interview with him here at the Kootenai County Jail, but the public defense attorney representing him has since declined all future media interviews. Reporting in Coeur d'Alene, Amanda Rowley, Creme 2 News. Although the hearing was mostly virtual, the suspect did appear in person here at the federal courthouse. During the hearing, the judge read the charge against him and the maximum penalty he faces if convicted. Alexander Mercurio was arrested over the weekend for allegedly planning to attack people at Coeur d'Alene churches on behalf of the terrorist group ISIS. Messages uncovered by the FBI show Mercurio allegedly planned to use weapons, including firearms, knives, and a flame sword to kill as many people as possible. An indictment filed in this case says Mercurio is charged with attempting to provide material support to a designated foreign terrorist organization. He pleaded not guilty to this and denied the criminal forfeiture allegation, which means he does not want the court to seize his property if convicted. Well, certainly it was a great surprise. Coeur d'Alene Mayor Jim Hammond says the 18-year-old's alleged plans are not tolerated in the community. I think that anybody living in North Idaho uh, would be crazy to think that they could get any sympathy from anybody else regarding ISIS or any support for any kind of similar organization. Mayor Hammond is reassured, though, by the swift action law enforcement took before anyone got hurt. I'm very appreciative that they caught him before he could cause any harm. And I do truly trust that they will do the same in terms of monitoring and uh, being vigilant about any other dangers that we have within the community. Court documents say Mercurio is facing a maximum penalty of up to 20 years in prison. He will now remain in U.S. Marshal custody pending the trial for this case. The trial is currently scheduled to start May 28th. At this point, proceedings will remain here in Coeur d'Alene. Amanda Rowley, Crem 2 News. The individual really represents a, a growing issue that we're facing in the United States. There's this um, increasing issue of radicalization after the COVID era when individuals were 
forced into their homes a lot more frequently than they would have been in the past. So they're consuming the internet and the the weird parts of the internet, the things that get a little bit uh, scary or a little bit risky. Do you think that most people would be alarmed at how easily someone can kind of fall down this rabbit hole and the more they look, the more they find? It's very easy to find a lot of this content online. Uh, and the more one gets involved with this space, the more uh, doors might open. The way the internet works today, it's very simple to be funneled into a much more dangerous environment with actors who are looking to exploit you, radicalize you, latch onto those grievances you might hold and push you towards something that we might consider terrorism or just political violence. So they might be an ISIS framework, uh, so maybe anti-Western or anti-United States, or they might just be looking to punch the enemy in the face a bit and seek any soft target. And in this case, with this individual, he was looking to target churches. What does it tell you that it took two years that the FBI was tracking him, monitoring him for almost two years before actually making the arrest? Generally, what we've seen in these cases is that they're waiting for some threshold to be crossed, whether it's from a criminal statute or whether it's from a behavioral indication. He obviously started to ramp up. He clearly went forth and started to push towards the actual attack. While it's very scary what, um, what it, he was allegedly planning, did we dodge a bullet a little bit in the fact that he didn't land with an actual ISIS person, but rather an informant? It shows that the government and the law enforcement agencies that we have in this country are doing their job, right? They're doing things that are helping prevent violence. You know, the reality is people are going to find ways to carry out acts of violence. And it's really good to see that he was not able to see it through to fruition. I'm outside the public safety building where the Spokane County Sheriff's Office says the investigation into Robert Abbott's disappearance is still ongoing. I had the chance to talk with Abbott's wife and close friend. Robert Abbott's wife, Star, describes her husband as someone who always goes out of his way to help others. He's a good person. He helped everybody. Robert Abbott has been missing for almost a week. Star Abbott says she lives with her husband but was at her mother's home when Robert Abbott went missing. I didn't get out here till the following day and looked at the window and I noticed that the dogs didn't have any food. Star Abbott says when she came home, she found blood on the floor. I didn't even know that it was blood at first. I um, was questioning it and it was dry, whatever it was. Deputies say major crime detectives are processing evidence found at the scene of where Abbott is presumed to have gone missing. And the evidence was that they, they may have found a bullet fragment and uh, maybe in the couch cushion and on the ground. Star Abbott says her husband's missing BMW was eventually found at a trailer park in Mead. He's like my brother. He's a very close friend. Deanna Ladding has known Robert Abbott for more than 20 years. For the past week, she's also helped Star in the search for her husband. He's got a funny personality. <laughs> um, He's witty. <laughs> he goes above and beyond. Star Abbott and Ladding hope Robert Abbott is found soon. I mean, I'm never going to stop looking for Robert. Yeah. That will never stop. We will not stop until we find him. I need, I need answers. They are now asking for the public's help in finding him, even offering a $20,000 reward. I need, I need my husband. I need my friend. I mean, we need more people to help us find Robert. The Spokane County Sheriff's Office says it is still investigating the case as a missing persons. Deputies cannot say whether or not they feel foul play was involved in Abbott's disappearance. The Spokane County Sheriff's Office is urging anyone with information about the disappearance of Robert Abbott to call Crime Check. That number is 509-456-2233. In Spokane, Nathan Hyun, Crime 2 News. We are here to serve the community and we couldn't be more proud to do that. I couldn't be more proud of the team that, that now I get the honor of, of just being being at the forefront of and uh, without that team, I couldn't do it. What does it mean to you to be the first female chief? Oh, wow. Um, you know, so I'm honored to be recognized as the first female uh, for the fire chief in Spokane. So. Um, as firefighters, you know, we our, our, our duty is to serve and protect, and it's about the skills, the experience that we bring. So I really want the focus, while I'm proud and I'm very honored to represent uh, women in the fire service, I want the focus not to be on the gender, but on the important work that we have ahead of us. You did mention that you were looking forward to adapting and evolving 
recognizing that the needs of the community are changing. So what do you mean by that? And what do you see changing? We're called the fire department and fighting fire is, is really, it's a very important part of what we do, but it's one small part. So really making sure that um, we are focused on not only firefighting, but prevention, the emergency medical part, the, um, the mental health part that we can play a role in. Um, so it's, it's making sure that there is an understanding out there in the community of we show up in a, in a big fire truck, but we bring so many solutions with us on that fire truck. So you had originally said that you did not want to pursue the chief position when you agreed to serve in the interim role. So what made you change your mind? Um, well, I'll say Mayor Brown's very compelling um, <laughs> and she's doing some great work. So it's, uh, it's pretty exciting to, to remain a part of her team. And um, it's pretty exciting to remain a part of the team that, uh, that we have here at the, at the fire department. So we have some just uh, some really talented people that want to do some good work for the community and being able to be on that team and help lead that team uh, is a compelling reason to stick around. To put it mildly, we live in a very connected world. From our laptops to our phones, both of these are required for me to do my job. But connecting to the rest of the world can often put our data privacy at risk. Washington's lawmakers, Senator Maria Cantwell and Representative Kathy McMorris Rogers, have one goal for their new data privacy bill, the American Privacy Rights Act. What it does is establish a, a uniform national data privacy rights for Americans. If passed, some of the things the bill would do is give consumers the right to control how tech companies such as Google, Meta and TikTok use their personal data. For the first time ever, it would give users the right to opt out of certain data practices and the right to access and delete their data. We don't even know if our personal data might be shared or sold with, without our knowledge. You're, you will be notified in the future. We want consumers to have a right to say that how their data could be used and to stop it if they don't want that data sold to a third party. The bill would also preempt current state laws According to both lawmakers, data privacy has been a concern for several years, but the increased use of AI recently seems to be ringing alarms for Congress. That all of a sudden our colleagues who probably had been saying in the past, well, I don't know about a privacy bill. All of a sudden there was everybody uh, in Congress saying, oh my gosh, we need a privacy bill. Right now, the two legislators expect to introduce the bill in both the House and Senate in the next few weeks. Now, this bill seems to have a deadline since Representative McMorris Rogers is not seeking re-election. But both legislators say they're optimistic they can get this bill passed by then. In Spokane, Cody Proctor, Crime 2 News. The human pet connection is powerful. Hi there. Especially here. So my name is Scott. I am part of the care team here. Scott Campbell is a veterinary chaplain at WSU's Vet Teaching Hospital. Well, my very best wishes. As a chaplain, he feels that connection day in and day out. We tell our companions things that we wouldn't tell another soul. And they love us and they think we're the wonderful people that we want to be. For as common as that is, Scott's job is not. Based on what I've heard, I think that there are only three other people that are doing something similar to this. Making his connection with people like Nicole that much more meaningful. I have a 13-year-old dachshund named Harriet. We've had her her whole little life. More than enough time to grow that deep connection Scott sees. Honestly, it felt really validating of how much I love and adore my, my pet to have have that type of care. Care not only for Nicole, but for Harriet too. I don't know if I'm going to be here tomorrow morning when Harriet goes into surgery. And one of the things that Scott offered was he said, I can go and, you know, pray with her quietly before she goes under anesthesia. And that, that moment of comfort of just knowing that someone's going to be there for her in that way just means everything. Yeah. 
Thank Take you, care. Scott. Scott is creating meaningful connections of his own. Aww. With, of course, pets and people, and now mm -hmm. other chaplains. I've set up the American Association of Veterinary Chaplains in order to build this as a profession within chaplaincy. Hoping to bring care and connection like this. Sounds like things are going good. Beyond the Palouse. In Pullman, Nicole Hernandez, Crumb 2 News. Racially restrictive covenants are a historically used tactic to keep minority groups out of specific neighborhoods. That language still exists in some Spokane property titles. A local title and escrow company is now offering to help property buyers get rid of them for free. A 1948 U.S. Supreme Court ruling made racially restrictive covenants illegal. While this means they're no longer enforceable, the language remains intact on some property titles. In 2018, Washington State revised the law to give property owners the right to declare the restrictions as void. They can do this by filing a restrictive covenant modification document. We're improving Spokane one property at a time. It's a process Vista Title and Escrow is helping property buyers navigate for free, something CEO Anthony Carollo is proud to be a part of. We're taking the opportunity to help the buyer declare these void and, and just, um, just take that stand to fix a past wrong. I think it's huge. To be clear, Carollo says the company can only offer this service to those in the process of buying a property. Our title officers are already examining the title. And, and they have an opportunity to find it. They can flag it in the file. We can send the home buyer a notice and we can say, if you want to correct this, we'll prepare the document. Now, state law says the modification document legally strikes, but does not physically erase the void and illegal discriminatory provisions from the original document. I see this as an opportunity for us to make this piece of property better. Now, we want to bring you more to every story, so let's take a look at where these racially restrictive covenants exist. Now, Carollo pointed me to this map of Spokane posted online based on community research, and it highlights areas where racially restrictive language exists in their property titles. Now, we can see it shows a high concentration here in the Shadle neighborhood, but we also found some scattered across Hilliard and Spokane's South Hill. Now, you can determine if a restrictive covenant is associated with your property by visiting the Spokane County website. It says first check with land title records with the county county auditor's office, which are free to view, but there are fees if you want to get copies. Now another source is your owner's title insurance policy, which is usually issued upon the purchase of the property. Then the auditor's website walks you through the steps and information you need to record a restrictive covenant modification document. Now the process of recording this modification document is completely free through the county auditor's office. We'll share a link to the Spokane map and the county instructions on crem.com. Amanda Rowley, Crem 2 News. When you walk into your local Rosars, you'll see bags like this one that are stacked up. This is a Crem Cares diaper drive bag. You take it up to the checkout, they'll mark you down for $10 and it will help a family with diapers and wipes for a week. It's just a little bit to get through to help a family going through challenging times and it helps a child. And for one local mom, she said it helped her be the mom and the person she wanted to be. Capturing perfect moments in time, that's Heavenly Petrosky's specialty. She's a mom of three and a professional photographer. It feels good that I can go back to work now. In between the perfect moments, there have certainly been trying times. I didn't have extra income or anything, so it was really tough. When her third child was born with some special needs, Heavenly needed to be at the hospital and her husband needed to work. They needed Vanessa Behan. A gal at the hospital told me about them and told me to give them a call. It was just like a huge weight lifted off my shoulder. Once I knew that they were somewhere safe and they had fun and they, you know, they were happy. The safe haven at Vanessa Behan gave Heavenly and her family some peace of mind and some financial help when needed most. Having all the medical bills pile up and not being able to afford diapers at times, so, and formula, so I knew that I could always get resources from them if I needed. Diapers certainly don't come cheap. Parents spend between $70 and $100 a month for them per child. That can add up to thousands for parents with multiple young children. 
Last year, Vanessa Behan handed out 364,000 diapers. Those diapers, many of them from the Creme Cares diaper drive, are stored here in the back room at Vanessa Behan, where inventory is now low. The Creme Cares diaper drive is going on right now. The numbers tell the need, and the people at Vanessa Behan can explain the why of the Creme Cares diaper drive, saying we all play a role in keeping kids safer, and that includes removing some of the financial stress for parents. Diapers are just one avenue that really helps support a family in a time where they're incredibly vulnerable and where it can make a huge difference. And so this diaper drive is just one piece of the puzzle, but it is a big, important piece of that puzzle. For some families, it might be a one-time ask, or for others, it can be longer term. It helped Heavenly, so now that she can focus on things ahead. So the Creme Cares diaper drive going on now through the 21st. And when you walk into Area Rosers, you'll see folks wearing these stickers. Just a reminder that families need your help. So you can either donate at local Rosars by buying a Creme Cares diaper drive bag, go to Washington Trust Bank branches, make a donation there. Or of course, you can text us and we'll send a link right to your phone. Give me that thing. Oh, this is Reba. Oh, give me that thing. She's our newest member of uh, the Avalanche Rescue Dog Program. Jeff Thompson here, Idaho Panhandle Avalanche Center. I'm an avalanche forecaster, but also work on Schweitzer Ski Patrol and work with Avalanche Rescue Dogs. Reba is almost nine weeks old. And I've worked with lots and lots of avalanche dogs, and um, my other dog, Annie, is uh, she's up on the mountain today, but she's retired, recently retired. Reba is, is now kind of going to follow in her footsteps. Reba! It's pretty awesome that even this day and age, and you know, with all the technology and phones and everything that we, we have going on, that really these little noses are the, the best tool we have sometimes to find people buried in the snow. They are in training from the moment we get them, and that's why we, we typically like to get dogs that were born in, in early winter, in January, February, so that we can have a couple months at the end of the season to do all this sort of stuff, sights and sounds and smells and get used to snowmobiles and ski lifts. And then she's gonna have all summer to, to grow up and hopefully next season she'll hit the ground running. I got involved when I was a young ski patroller and I saw a need at the ski area that I worked at. We didn't have dogs at the time. And so I, I ended up getting a Labrador and we ended up starting an organization called Colorado Rapid Avalanche Dogs. And, you know, I've been on so many um, rescues and incidents with the dogs and worked them that you just realize how important these resources are. I mean, if somebody's buried in the snow without, you know, an avalanche beacon, it's really the best way to find them. We didn't really have dogs here 10 years ago in, in the Panhandle, so to be able to say we have I think six or seven certified avalanche dogs that are available to go, you know, help with people that get caught in avalanches is, is pretty awesome. Right, kid? <laughs> Everybody can make a piece of art, right? But I think like that is like anything, there is different levels. But yeah, anybody can make art. I believe so. I started doing drawings and stuff since I was a little kid and I never imagined myself doing anything else. Seeing how you can somehow create a world, an imaginary world through these illustrations and project feelings into other people, I really enjoy it. It fulfills me. It's also a process that is painful sometimes, it's difficult, it's kind of like another way of practicing endurance or mental toughness like an athlete will do. So how did you get out here to Spokane out of all the places in the world? Uh, well, love. My wife, she's from here. Um, we met in Moscow, Idaho. Um, then we just pretty much transitioned to this place, I mean, this city where, where she grew up. So, so yeah, I have been growing to love it and I'm very proud to, to, to call it my home. Growing up in Venezuela, sometimes I felt that people were always like kind of somehow celebrating whatever was coming from outside the country and not really taking uh, or considering what was going inside. And I feel that Spokane was kind of like the same. Sometimes when we're living in an environment, it's really difficult to see the beauty of it because we're just so accustomed to it. 
I feel that here is a way, a, a place where you can materialize ideas and the community will support them. If you want to somehow uh, transform your environment and you put the efforts on it, like it's going to make an impact and, you, and that impact is tangible. So I love that about Spokane. Thank you for joining us on Creme 2 Plus for a look at some of the biggest news stories of the past week. For the most current news throughout the weekend, you can watch our latest newscast here on Creme 2 Plus. Just look for it at the bottom of the navigation menu. I'm Tim Pham. Thanks for watching.